तापकाय च धर्म सेवधर्मस्वूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठा रामकृष्णा ते नम गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी एंड वेलकम बैक स्वामी शंकरानंद जी इज हियर एंड आई रिकग्नाइज अ नंबर ऑफ फेसेस फ्रॉम येस्टरडे येस्टरडे वॉज सेइंग हाउ आई फेल्ट Sedona is such a spiritual place, a place of light and magic. Maybe those of you who stay here, um, you tend to get used to it. You even tend to get used to heaven, you know. So <laughs> it sometimes requires an outsider with a fresh look to a fresh uh, perspective to make you see what you have already got. The sense I got yesterday, I, was, I felt so inspired by the group we saw yesterday. that i decided to do something brave yesterday we spoke about the mandukya upanishad the secret of om and among all the upanishads the mandukya is supposed is the smallest and is supposed to be the most powerful it succinctly presents the entire teaching of non dual vedanta and you think that you cannot go any higher than non duality or any higher than the mandukya upanishad but as it turns out you can um there are different texts in non dual vedanta the highest of which is something like this text which i'm going to take up today let me get the books here this is called the ashtavakra sanhita or also known as the ashtavakra gita normally i do not teach this uh, for certain reasons which i will mention but i have taught it on occasion and i have been surprised to see how popular those talks have become immediately i guess it goes directly to the heart as a name one of the translations is called the heart of awareness it goes directly to the heart of the, the non dual truth there are different translations available one is published by our order at least a couple are published by our order in india i come from the ramakrishna order of monks um in india it's known as the ramakrishna mission it's a very well known organization and its headquarters is based in calcutta but in the west we are known as the vedanta society because sri ramakrishna's disciple swami vivekananda came to the west was the first hindu monk to come to the west in um, 1893 there was a world parliament of religions in fact this year there is another world parliament of religions in toronto uh, he came to the world parliament of religions the first one in chicago 1893 uh, for the first hindu monk to come out of india uh, to the west and teach vedanta the philosophy of hinduism so the organizations he set up are the vedanta societies in fact the first one he set up is in new york the vedanta society of new york in 1894 so that's where i am right now it's a small center a one swami center one monk center uh, which is closed uh, in summer july and august luckily so that al- allows me to be here in sedona i i it's it's in manhattan um very close to the central park upper west side and uh, i see people walking past the center you say vedanta it's just a old brownstone building vedanta society of new york okay and then they stop and take a step back and say 1894 that's really because in new york in manhattan you don't really find people uh, holding on to a particular saying a particular place for more than 100 years you know <laughs> um so there are this text ashtavakra there are translations from our order this is one translation i often recommend an a, a translation made here in america by thomas byron not byron the poet it's thomas byron who is a professor of english here in the united states um he passed away a few years ago uh, but but a beautiful translation if you are interested in the text and i assure you you will be after we finish or many of you who are followers of vedanta you already know about this text i'm sure you own a copy 
it, it is a good idea to have two versions of the text. One is maybe something like this, which is a beautiful translation, very inspiring, poetic, to the point. And one like this, which is precise. It's got the, actu the actual Sanskrit and the translations. So for inspiration, for meditation, this is good. But if you're studying this and uh, you also want, once in a while, you want to keep it real, you want to see what exactly was said in the original Sanskrit, then you want a text like this, which is more scholarly and which has a literal translation. I'm still beating about the bush. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm uh, sometimes hesitant to start on this text, you see, in Vedanta, there, uh, there are three kinds of texts. The process of teaching Vedanta goes through three phases. Hearing, reflecting, meditating. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. The, the central two truths of Vedanta are taught by the teacher and you listen to them attentively, with respect. You, you get the idea, what is Vedanta telling me? And what Vedanta is telling us is what we heard yesterday. It's simple and direct. That thou art. You are the absolute. What we consider God in different religions, you are that. Uh, your reality. In fact, I can't put it in better words than the great Christian mystic of, of uh, medieval Germany, Meister Eckhart. Very non-dualistic, his writings. If you'll, he says, the ground of my soul and the ground of God are one and the same. That's beautiful. That's exactly the Mahavakya, the great statement of the Upanishads. I and God are one, not as this little individual and the Lord of the universe, not in that sense. That's ridiculous. It's not possible. But what I am, what you are in reality and what God is in reality are one and the same thing. Eckhart puts it very precisely. The ground of my soul and the ground of God are one and the same. So that's the first stage, hearing these truths. I we have become aware of this great teaching of the immanent divinity within us. That's one. Then what happens is, the next stage is, we have many questions. Many questions. How is this possible? I would like to understand it rationally. I have many, many questions, doubts, skeptical um, arguments. So then you enter a phase, in Sanskrit it is called mananam. Mananam means cogitating, thinking, reflecting, questioning, arguing. So that's an intensive phase um, which you go through at the end of which, you know you've reached the end of which, of, of that phase when you realize you've got clarity. At the end of the first phase, hearing, you can say, I know what Vedanta says, but. What's the but there? I don't get it. I have many questions. At the end of the second phase of reasoning, you will say, I know what Vedanta says, and now I get it. I understand it. There's still a but there. What's the but there? The but is, I, um, it has not yet transformed my life. I know it. I have understood it. But it is, you promised that I'll be able to overcome suffering, and I will get... I'll be in bliss and you know, attain profound peace and ha lasting happiness and peace and overcome transcend suffering. That has not happened. I still suffer. I'm still upset. I still have problems in life. So it's not delivered. So before you take Vedanta to consumer court, that you promised this <laughs> and you have not delivered yet, there is a third stage. The third stage is meditation. Vedantic meditation, a special kind of meditation. What, what you do there is, what you have heard, what you have understood, and you're convinced now, stay with it. This morning I was discussing with my host that you can call it marinating. You know, when you finish cooking, you don't immediately take the pot of the, of the stove. You put a lid on it and let it stew, let it absorb the juices and the spices and in the heat there. Similarly, once you have got it, once there is clarity, you don't move on immediately to the next book. You sit with it, you absorb it, till you become it. You are it already, you recognize yourself as this message. So the third stage is called Nididhyasana. 
it is related to the Sanskrit word dhyana. Dhyana means meditation. So this is a special kind of Vedantic meditation. Now why I am saying this is, the Vedanta texts are also of three kinds. The Upanishads, like the one we discussed yesterday, they are the root texts, the, fundament, the basic texts. They tell you the truth. They are meant to be heard, studied. That's where you first get the truth. And they are the most important. All of Vedanta is based on the Upanishads. Basically, Vedanta is defined as the teaching of the Upanishads. But they are meant to be heard, studied. You get, it, get the truth from them. Then there are texts which are heavy on logic, on reasoning. Um, there are texts like Advaita Siddhi, Khandana Khanda Khadya, um, Chitsuki. There are many other texts like that. Which, as somebody told me, is enough. Any one of them is enough to fry your brain. <laughs> all the questions you can think of, and many that you could never think of, they are all asked and discussed threadbare. I remember once when I was a novice and learning Vedanta, I asked one of my teachers, a senior monk, um, and I remember, and still remember, in the front of the main gate of the monastery in Calcutta, uh, across Calcutta. Uh, I asked him, uh, can I ask you a, swam, a question, Swami? Uh, I thought he might be offended about this. And he said, I've asked without fear. Better minds than yours have thought about this, <laughs> have questioned it, have doubted it, have argued it out for a period of at least 15 centuries. 14 centuries, from Shankaracharya's time at least, even before that. But 14 centuries, definitely we know history, historically. So, so many texts, those are texts based on logic. Every question taken up, argued threadbare by some of the finest brains we come across in history. But this book is not about that either. <laughs> After that comes the third stage which I mentioned, meditation. So, you know what it says, you have argued it through, the storm clouds are gone, and then in the clarity of the light which remains, you stay with it. You stay with that truth. And there are some texts like that. This is one of them, the Ashtavakra Gita. It's named after the person who teaches. Ashtavakra is a sage and the name is actually, it's just a, like a nickname. He is supposed to have this long story. Everything in India has a long story. <laughs> uh, so, He's supposed to have eight bends in his body, eight bends in his body, the crooked body. So, Ashtavakra, eight bends. And he teaches the emperor, the philosopher king Janaka. So, there are, there's a stu teacher and a student. The teacher is Ashtavakra and the student is Janaka, the emperor, the philosopher emperor. That's it, that's the background of the text. And all this text does is, it tells you again and again and again, just one thing, that you are the Absolute. In so many different ways, it just tells you one thing. The entire conclusion of the Vedanta, it radiates out from this book. This is not the only book, there is another book which comes up to this level, it's called the Avadhuta Gita, which is also exactly like this. So you might call it a Nididhyasana text, a meditation text. This is not, not an introduction, certainly not, this is the end of the road. Beyond this lies only silence. Nothing more can be said after this. This is not argument. There are no arguments here. There are no arguments here. There is no fancy language here. There is no poetry here. There is no philosophy here. None of that. There is only one grand theme repeated with an awesome monotony here. Again and again and again. <laughs> you pick it up at any point, any verse, anywhere, it just says the same thing. In different ways, but it points out, it just it's a pointing out, continuously forcing you back to your real nature. Uh, Byram in his introduction, beautiful introduction. In fact, why should I paraphrase him? You can just see, I can just read it out. What he says here. All right, let me just paraphrase because it's a long introduction, very beautiful introduction. He says, when all the scriptures have had their say, 
When all the philosophers have fallen silent, Ashtavakra begins. He begins and he says the words, they barely touch the page. They seem to emerge out of light and shine before you briefly and fading back into the light again. So they seem to glide off the pages. And it is true, it, he's put it so beautifully, but I agree entirely with him. Incredible. Beyond this, as I said, lies only silence. There's a reason why I'm selling it so hard to you, so that you have the undivided attention. You listen carefully, you have the undivided attention. Now, before we go into it, note of caution, warning. Um, there is every chance of misunderstanding here. You will feel, first of all, the first thing that people do when they listen to this, they are inspired. And the first thing they do is give up all their spiritual practices. Do it at your own peril. That's not the point. Oh, I have read Ashtavakra. Now I get it. Why was I praying and meditating and doing <laughs> yoga or whatever? Uh, serving others and... No. Come, 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 come. Don't worry, we still haven't started. <laughs> come. Yes. Come on in, settle down. Yes. So that is one big problem that um, um, you give up spiritual practices. Never ever do that. Whatever practice you are doing, please continue to do it with all sincerity. It's a serious, a serious problem. Uh, I remember I was in the high Himalayas once and um, there was this gentleman who had come from the mountain town of Dehradun. Um, he was uh, staying in the hut next to mine. He was not a monk, he was a retired person, person who had retired from his job, a spiritual seeker. And he was staying there and I spoke with him, he was reading this book, Ashtavakra. And he said, here is the truth. And my guru, and he mentioned a monk who is his guru in that, that city of Dehradun, whom I know to be a very good monk, a very good teacher. My guru never told me about this. All he do did was he taught me rituals. Um, you know, in the, in the Hindus, they water the Tulsi plant, the holy basil, and they chant mantras and they fast. So all of that, all of that is just kindergarten stuff. This is the real stuff. He, he never told me. And I asked him, does your guru know about this book? He said, yeah, he, I, he does. I got it from him. So do you think he has understood this book? Yes. Uh, and after that he still continues with his fasting and praying and watering the holy basil? I said, yes. <laughs> so maybe some, he has something, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. Never abandon your, your uh, spiritual practices. Another problem listening to this is get you, people are in a hurry. People get into a hurry. I remember I met this young monk not a monk, he, was a, he, was a, he wanted to become a monk. He was visiting from New York in one of our ashrams in, in uh, India. It, that's also in the Himalayas. He was sitting under a tree and reading this book. And he said, I am anxious, worried. I said, why are you worried? He said, because he works for a wonderful firm in uh, Wall Street and he's got a two-month sabbatical and it's almost over and it's not yet enlightened. He has to go back and join his job as a... <laughs> Stockbroker on Wall Street. I said, no, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> It'll take time, you know, I sort of... Uh, he said, no, no, I don't like that attitude. No, he's, very, he's, he's very New York. To-do list. Enlightenment. Must be done. <laughs> Two months have gone and I'm not enlightened yet. So don't be in a hurry. This is the end of the road. The game of life is at an end here. It's not for nothing that I use the storm metaphor. Storms of life have to be gone through. The storms of seeking have to be gone through. And when the last cloud has faded away, then only you pick up this book, Ashtavakra. I'm using this particular metaphor because uh, there's a beautiful Zen poem, a, a haiku with a Japanese uh, haiku. I, of course, read it in translation, but it's very apt for Ashtavakra. It's like this. Uh, the Zen master, he writes, The last rain cloud has drained away. 
the skies are clear and we sit the old mountain and I till only the mountain remains you see now what that points towards that's very Ashtavakra and the whole book is like that it's a continuous meditation when we do this I will speak I'll take up maybe one verse or two verses you listen to what I'm saying but you really don't have to. If you feel uh, meditative inwards, you can very happily close your eyes and stay and be inwards and be still. Don't worry, you won't miss anything. There's nothing new. It's just the same thing. When you open your eyes and your ears and listen again, I'll be saying the same thing. <laughs> Ashtavakra is saying the same thing throughout the book. So do that. That will be actually the point of the entire book. But not if you feel sleepy. If you feel sleepy, then open your eyes and listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. One more uh, little anecdote and then I'm done. Huh. It's about Sri Ramakrishna. He loved this book. It's very interesting. People think he was a devotee, a simple devotee of the Divine Mother Kali. He would cry to God and he would sing and dance and have mystic experiences. Seems to be very far from the philosophical silence of Ashtavakra. <laughs> but he kept this book. And he wouldn't let anybody read it. But his greatest disciple, Narain, who was Vivekananda, who came to this country, Swami Vivekananda. And Vivekananda did not like it. He hated this book. <laughs> so Ramakrishna called him and he said, read it. He would give it. And he would look around. He was like a child. So he would look around. Is anybody listening? People might be harmed if they listen to this. You know, the religious, simple religious faith might be harmed. So he would shut the doors and the windows and said, call his favorite disciple and read it. And when Vivekananda would read this, he would say, what craziness. I am God, you are God, the table is God, the pot is God, and the pan is God. Uh, are these teachers mad? And Sri Ramakrishna would say, oh, no, no, why are you saying this? Um, don't call them mad. Uh, one day it so happened that Vivekananda was, at that time he was not called Vivekananda, he was called Narain, the young, his original pre-monastic name. He was standing outside the door uh, talking with Another person who stayed in the Kali temple, Hazra, who was a great skeptic. Uh, I mean, he was, he, was, he was a character. The two of them were talking and laughing and Sri Ramakrishna comes out in an ecstatic state and says, what are you talking about? And Narain says, uh, the door is God, the bed is God and the pot is God. <laughs> what, what, what silliness. And Sri Ramakrishna, instead of saying anything, he comes and he touches Narain on the chest and uh, Narain goes into an ecstasy. He actually sees the same light within and without permeating the entire universe. In a daze he goes home and there is still that park. Uh, it's called the Hedua Park in, in front of uh, his house. The house is still there. And he says, I banged my head against the railings to think, to see whether they were real stuff or not. So he is high on philosophy, not on anything else. <laughs> he sees a horse carriage coming towards him. He has no desire to move out of its way. He sees light and light here. The same, same existence everywhere. Like water flowing into water. Luckily he did move out of the way, otherwise he wouldn't have come here and I wouldn't be here today also. <laughs> And so on. It lasted for three whole days. And uh, he was eating. And it all seemed the same to him. And his poor mother thought that the boy has got a disease or something and is going to die soon. Because he can't distinguish between tastes. And Anyway, so he snapped out of it after that. And, but he never again doubted it. Uh, and he was the one who came here to the United States. Imagine in the late 19th century. And dared to say before American crowds... I am that ocean of which Buddhas and Christs are but waves. Not I as Vivekananda, of course not. But as the Absolute. You are. And you, all of us can say exactly the same thing. That's what Ashtavakra is speaking about. Okay. I'm trying to use up all my time, but that won't work. <laughs> Let's start. I'll take up one verse.
This is from the first chapter itself, the fourth verse, one of my favorites, but it's like that all through the book. It goes like this, the original Sanskrit, then the translation, and then we will go into it. Yadi deham prithakritya jiti vishramya tishthasi adhunaiva sukhi shanto bandha mukto bhavishyasi It means, if you can see yourself as other than the body, and rest in pure consciousness. Right now, by that alone, you will be in permanent bliss, forever beyond suffering, attaining moksha, freedom, free of all bondages. So that's the verse. Let's take it up slowly. The very first verse, all of these words are worth meditating upon. That's the beauty of Ashtavakra. He has condensed the entire philosophy into this. If the first verse is also important. First word, if. That's the point where worldly life and spirituality, they take two different, it's a fork in life. Remember this about spirituality, not just about Ashtavakra, about all kinds of spiritual life. Remember this, easy to do, easy not to do. Whether it is prayer or yoga or service or, or meditation or philosophy, whatever it is, whatever path you take up, and especially Ashtavakra, it's easy, really easy to do, and also very easy not to do. Do it, you get this, these results, peace forever, and, and you abide in bliss. Do not do it, samsara awaits. This samsara, this life, this is, will go on. So easy to do, easy not to do. If I make a distinction between conventional religion and spirituality. This if stands for that. Conventional religion is, many people are religious. They have religious beliefs. See, if I use God for bettering my life, my life is better because of God. This what life? This life of samsara. So I want a job or... I, I have a job, I don't want to get laid off, I pray to God. Uh, or I have a beloved person in the hospital, I want him or her to recover, I pray to God. In suffering, one prays to God. For what? Not for God. For alleviating my suffering. And it's alright. The vast amount of religion is for that. Even our new age movements, most of them are for bettering this life. I want to remain young and flexible. Yoga. No matter that, that was never the purpose of yoga. <laughs> That's a side benefit, a spin-off. The purpose of yoga is all this immortality, the, the enlightenment, freedom. Always, all these paths lead to there. So, in distress, in fear, in suffering, one turns to religion, and that's good, but that's conventional religion. There's a saying, there, is, there are no atheists in the foxholes. In war, there are no atheists, because when you are in, in terror of being killed in the next moment, then whatever one's previous uh, uh, intellectual position, one rushes to pray to God. And so that's because we are in fear, in anxiety, in terror. And that's also okay, but I'm saying that's conventional religion. When one is in trouble, one turns to God. You're not in trouble, but you want something material. You turn to God. You may not want anything particular, but you want your life should be okay. There shouldn't be trouble. You sort of bribe God into it. That I'm attending church or going to the temple and doing the puja and giving the offerings. Oh God, don't create trouble for me. <laughs> now that's Treating God as a convenience. You have a, you have a dishwasher or a washing machine and makes your life better. You have God makes your life better. And that's most of religion in the world all through human history. And again, I'm not condemning it. That's good. In the Bhagavad Gita also Krishna says, four kinds of people worship me. One is those who are in trouble. The second is not in trouble, but they want something in this world. They also worship me. Third is inquirer, spiritual seeker. They worship me. The fourth is the enlightened. They also worship me. 
And he says, among all of them, he says, all of them are good. He says, all are fortunate because they have faith in God. But the last one is specially dear to me, the enlightened. Because that one knows me in truth. So anyway, conventional religion and real spirituality. The difference is this. One is, God for bettering my life. God for my life. Conventional religion. Life for God. Spirituality. What am I about? I'm ha about having a good time in this world, sort of managing the troubles and sort of cruising through this world nicely, unscathed. God can help me, so you are hired. God is hired. <laughs> yes, I've heard so many times. I prayed and prayed and prayed and, and uh, just recently I heard of this gentleman whose son died and he was a very religious person. Now he stopped. I don't believe in any of that anymore. Why? Because of this tragedy in my life. We can understand, we can sympathize, but look at the psychology. God was hired for doing a job, didn't do his job, laid off. <laughs> I don't believe in God anymore because he didn't do his job. Okay, that's conventional religion. But the same thing could be spiritual. That all right, I, I mean, you just go to the Bible. I read something so inspiring, beautiful, uh, King David. Uh, it, the story is like this, that uh, his son was um, very ill and he prayed and prayed and prayed to God and wept and then his son died. When his son died, he got up, took a bath, went to uh, his uh, throne and started administering the kingdom again and people were puzzled. When your son was still alive and you are praying, you are in so much grief and your son is now dead, you seem to be perfectly alright. How is this? And his answer is so beautiful. You see, this is the difference between conventional religion and spiritual. He was praying for his son's life. He, he said, I was praying while the boy was yet alive. I was praying to God so that God may perchance answer my prayers. But now that he has passed away, I know he will not come back to me again. I shall go to him one day. So I remain uh, holding on to God. You see, this is real spirituality. That man prayed for his son's life, but that the core... He is holding on to God. So this is real spirituality. Ashtavakra, he makes this distinction. If. This if is the fork. What do you want? You want enlightenment, moksha, nirvana, freedom. Then the price is all your life is about God. That's what you are about. Not becoming a multimillionaire in this world or becoming a Hollywood star. That might still happen. That might yet happen. Remember, the student here is an emperor. He's an emperor. So he's got everything in, his wor in the world. That might still happen, but that's not what you're about. That's not your point in life. Your point in life you, is you're a spiritual seeker. We all are spiritual seekers. And you have to be in some respect to be here today. If. Easy to do, easy not to do. Now, what do you have to do? Something very simple. He says, Yadi deham prithakritya. If you can see yourself as other than the body, how do you see yourself as other than the body? You remember the whole teaching of Vedanta is if we know ourselves as we truly are, we are immediately free. Now, the problem is we think we know who we are. Mark Twain said, it is not what you do not know that gets you into trouble. It's what we know that it just ain't so. That's what gets us into trouble. <laughs> I am not the body. It just ain't so. I am the body. I know. No, you don't. Very quickly, I'm going to give you certain pointers. We shall see right now how we are not the body. Right now. Not, these, are, these seem to be arguments. They are very beautiful arguments, very elegant and pointed. But at a deeper level, what Ashtavakra wants you to see is, they are pointings. They are showing you right now that you are not the body. Quickly, I'll use three such pointers. Arguments, you must understand what I said, grasp it intellectually, but then also see it right now. First argument, the body changes. In Sanskrit, they have um, this thing that the body undergoes six changes. It is born, not I am born, the body is born. Clearly, that's also a fact, the body is born. Being born, it comes into existence. That's a strange way of putting it. That's a second change. It was not there, now it is. 
The third change is it develops. It develops a baby, an infant, a little boy or girl, a teenager, a young person. It develops. And then it matures. The fourth, it comes into maturation. You reach, a, you hit a plateau. It's good. And then it begins inevitably to degenerate. A doctor told me, Swami, the truth is, after 40, it's all the way down. It's all, 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 all the way down. <laughs> after 40. You can manage it through healthy li living, living in Sedona, for example, and <laughs> yoga and uh, eating healthy. You can manage it. And it will be much better if you, than if you do not manage it. But still, it's going to go down. It's a lot of trouble. What, what used to be, without any kind of maintenance, used to maintain that kind of uh, energy and health when you were in your early 20s. Now, in your 40s, you have to work at it to, to, to maintain it. Yes, 40s or 50s. A German general, he writes in Second World War, you know, in the midst of the campaigns, he writes that, now I realize how Alexander the Great conquered half the world. He, he was 21. <laughs> It degenerates and then finally the sixth change is it dies. Hmm? Jayate, asti, vardhate, uh, viparinamate, apakshyate, nashyati in Sanskrit. So the sixth four changes. The body changes and yet what do we see? I see clearly I am the one who was the young child. Before that I was the infant. Before that I was the baby. I was then the baby body though it seems so different from my body now. I was there in the young child's body. I was there in the uh, teenager's body. I am there in the middle-aged person's body. And one day in the very old person's body, the old body, I am the same person. We have this sense of personal continuity, personal identity, an unchanging identification across the widely different bodies. Imagine the baby's body, so small. And the middle-aged person's body, so big and strong. And again, the old person's body, so stooped and frail and body changes. A nun in, uh, not the nun you have there on the mountains, the two, the two nuns are there, the big mountain features. A nun uh, in Santa Barbara, she was saying that, um, she's an elderly nun and she was saying that uh, once I was walking past the shop windows and I saw the reflection and I said, who's that old lady? <laughs> And she, uh, she was telling me that one of her friends, both of, both of them have, of course, aged, they were talking about some common acquaintances, acquaintances and saying that, look how old they have become. And this nun tells her friend, we've become old too. <laughs> and her friend says, nope, we haven't. And she is right. In one sense, it's the body which has aged. Clearly, it has changed. It changes the body. A doctor said every seven years almost all the cells, almost all the cells are replaced. Not at once, that would be weird like a snake <laughs> shedding its skin. Over the seven years it is replaced. So the body clearly changes and yet I feel I am the same over the time. Changing, unchanging. In Sanskrit, nitya, anitya. How can the changing and the unchanging be the same? How can the unchanging you be the same as the changing body? can't be the same. One pointer. Second pointer, even a little more subtle but more powerful. The body is an object. You are the experiencer of that object. You are the seer, the body is the scene. Look at this. This is something which is seen. The eyes are the seer. In a very naive way, the eyes are the seer and the book is seen. Clearly the book is different from the eyes. If the book were not different from the eyes, the eyes wouldn't be able to see the book. In fact, what is the limit of the vision of the eyes? Our natural answer is, it's out there, distance, or it's too small, size. Actually not. If you had a telescope, you can see out to the stars themselves. If you have a powerful enough microscope, you can see the viruses even. Electron microscope, you can see that. The limit of the vision of the eyes is not out there or, or the size or distance. It is here. It has to be different from the eyes. The only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. 
says, Swami, just stand in front of a mirror. Ah, but you see the reflection of your eyes. The eyes don't, just the way the eyes see this directly. The eyes don't see themselves directly. You cannot. You can see a reflection of your eyes. You can see a picture of your eyes. You can see a video of your eyes. But the eyes directly cannot see themselves. The seer and the seen are different. They have to be different. If you experience something, if you can see something, if you can touch something, if you can smell or taste something, it is an object, it is seen, seen within quotes, and you are the seer. Now look at the body, you can see it, you can touch it, taste it, smell it. The body is an object, hear it. The body is an object, an, ex an object of experience. You are the experiencer. The seer and the seen must be this different. You are always the experiencer of the body. The body is always experienced. They cannot be the same thing. In Sanskrit, drashta drishya. The very specific terms, powerful terms in Sanskrit. Drashta, seer. Drishya, seen. The body is experienced. You are the experiencer. Cannot be the same. Think about it. That's why you are not the body. Third pointer. I, can, I could go on. I'm giving you only three. The third one. You are sentient, aware, conscious. The body is insentient, not aware, not conscious. It might immediately sound controversial, but no, that's not true. You look at your own experience. A psychologist in New York, Greg Good, suggested this experiment to prove this point. Look at your hand right now. Right now, try it. Carefully note the nature of this experience. What is this experience like? Does it feel like I am looking at my hand? Or does it feel like my hand is looking at me? <laughs> that would be scary, like a horror movie or science fiction movie. You know the hand, yeah, you can put your hand down. Now, now it, it would be like the hand says, hello, I'm here. No. You always, look at it, it's, it's common, but you, it's something we never pay attention to. Always the feeling is, I am looking at the hand. I am aware of the hand. Look at the language. I am aware of the hand. Not the other way around. The hand is not aware of me. You will say, so, do it for the other hand. Do it for the legs, the belly, the chest, the head. Every part of your body is something that you are aware of. It's not aware of you. And the body is what? Composed of all these parts. So you are something which is aware of the body. Awareness is on your side, not on the side of the body. Did you follow the, the train of argument? Yeah. It's simple. Yeah, some of you do. I can see the smiles coming on your face. It's simple, elegant and powerful. Whatever you think of yourself as, you think of that as aware. In fact, when we think of ourselves as the body, we think of the body being aware. But when you begin to see the body is the object and I am aware of it, clearly awareness is on my side. I am the aware entity and the body is something I am aware of. This argument is different from the earlier one. The earlier argument was seer and seen, experiencer and experience, two have to be different. Here the, aware, the argument is Awareness and non-awareness. There are no good words in English. In Sanskrit, it's very clear. Chit jara. Jara, chit jara. Jara means inert, insentient. And chit means consciousness. I am conscious. Clearly, if you are wondering, am I conscious? That very, very fact proves that you are conscious. If you are wondering at all. Huh? <laughs> Poor old Descartes, who set out to doubt whatever he could doubt. And the, what is the one thing that you could not doubt? His, his own, why could he not doubt himself? Because he is aware. He said, I think, therefore I am. Cogito Gosum, I think, therefore I am. He could not doubt that he was thinking. Why? Even to doubt it is also a thought. Right? So, I am conscious. I am sentient. I am aware. Clearly. Even if I doubt that, still it's awareness which is doubting it. And the body is something that I am aware of. It's not aware. So I've given you three arguments. In Sanskrit, in English, permanent, changing, nitya, nitya. Body changing, I am permanent, as far as this body is concerned. 
The two cannot be the same. I am the experiencer and the body is the experienced, seer and seen. The two cannot be the same. I am aware and the body is not aware. The two cannot be the same. In Sanskrit, nitya nitya, drashta drishya, chit jara in Sanskrit. Because of these reasons, I cannot be the body. Ashtavakra says that. I cannot be the body. I am something apart from the body. He does not mean only the physical body. These very arguments apply equally powerfully to the mind also. Mind in Sanskrit is called sukshma sharira, subtle body. What is it composed of? Thoughts, emotions, perceptions, memories, ideas, desires, anger, hatred, lust, greed, love, um, unselfishness, all of these good qualities and bad qualities, virtues and vices. <laughs> The personality, that's the mind. Often we identify ourselves, grown-up people, educated people, sensitive people, we identify ourselves more with the mind than the body. We tend to feel we are embodied beings. We are this person in this body. That's what we normally feel. But we are not even the person. We are not even the mind. In fact, the very word person, it means a mask. The original, the root of the word person is persona. Which, was, which were like masks worn by ancient Greek actors on the stage. Uh, they would uh, have this, uh, they didn't have mics, so they would have this big masks with a big hole in front through which they could sp speak their lines. Sona means sound, persona through which the sound comes. It was a mask. What we think of ourselves as this person, the, literally the word person means mask. It's not you, it's a mask you put on. How do I know that? I identify myself totally with the person. The same arguments, changing and unchanging. Does the mind change? You say, oh boy, does it change? <laughs> Thousands of thoughts fleeting. The body changes glacially. It's like comparing a fast flowing river with a glacier. And the mind changes so fast. From the morning till now, how many times you've been happy, elated? How many times irritated, annoyed? How many times dull? How many times, uh, you know, after a cup of coffee, alert and excited? <laughs> how many times curious? How many times bored, desiring, um, uh, fulfilled, uh, hungered, nice breakfast, satiated? All those thoughts and feelings have come and gone in the mind and they're going through the mind right now. Even the ego, I, the feeling I, that's also the mind. It's also the mind. Changing, unchanging. You are the one who was happy. You are the one who was irritated. You are the one who remembered. You are the one who could not remember. All of these feelings, memory, understanding, not understanding, they come and go. That's the mind. And you are the unchanging experiencer of a changing mind. Changing and unchanging. You cannot be the mind. Seer and seen, drashta drishya, applies to the mind also. Are you aware of your thoughts? Yes. When you feel happy, are you aware of your happiness? Of course, otherwise how could I, see, how could I say that I am very happy but I don't feel it? That's crazy. <laughs> you can't say that. There's a terrible pain. Are you in pain? No, I don't feel it but there's a terrible pain. <laughs> no. You are the experiencer and the mind is something that is experienced. The two must be different. Just as this book is different from the I, seer and seen, you, whatever you are, must be different from the mind. Here comes a great teaching. I am not the mind. The mind is there. Don't worry, it won't go anywhere. <laughs> but I am not the mind. We are compulsive thinkers. You know, most of our problems are because of compulsive thinking. Modern, educated persons living in an advanced country, prosperous, good life and... You might think, no, no, you don't understand. My swa Swami, my life is pretty hard. All right, but not as hard as say yesterday we were hearing how the original settlers of Sedona, how they struggled and lived and died here, you know, constructing those roads. And so we think, somebody pointed out, do you know why, it's interesting why many people who kill themselves, tragically commit suicide, they shoot themselves in the head because to make that voice stop. 
compulsive thinkers. It's like, if I have a hand, do I have to grab everything? No. I will use my hands when I have to, and when I don't have to, they'll remain quiet. Just because I have legs, do I have to continuously run around? No. It reminds me of the old Charlie Chaplin movie, where I think uh, modern times, where he got a job in a factory, and his whole, all day long, he, all, all his job was he had a wrench and he had to tighten a couple of screws on the machine which came on a conveyor belt in front. So throughout the day he went on doing this. Hour after hour, just this, just this. And so when it stopped and lunch break was there, he couldn't stop. He kept on doing this all the time. <laughs> and the foreman came to scold him, uh, the big guy who, who was yelling at Cha uh, Charlie Chaplin. And Charlie Chaplin just catches the guy's nose and tweaks it like that. <laughs> He can't stop it. We have become like that. We can't stop our minds. It's compulsive thinking. You know one big reason why? Because we think we are the mind. If the mind stops, then I'm not there. No, you are there. You're exactly what you were when the mind was the mind of a kindergarten kid, when the mind was the mind of a teenager, when the mind was the mind of a young man or woman, and the mind now. All of that is the mind you are the same, all throughout. You are not the mind. Mind will be there, it will do its work. But you are not the mind. Because you are the experiencer and the mind is experienced. And the next one is even more startling. The third argument, do you remember? I am conscious, sentient. And the body is insentient, not conscious. We saw the hand experiment. Even the mind is not sentient, mind is not conscious. This is quite stunning to most people because what we think of, if anything is conscious in the world, it's the mind. And the reason is because the light of consciousness pervades the mind and everything in the mind shines in awareness. That's why we think the mind is conscious. No, no, no. The mind is not conscious. You are conscious. The room doesn't have light. It's the sun or the electric bulb which has light. The room is lit up by that. The light pervades the room. Similarly, you, the consciousness, pervade the mind, illumine the thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories, and they seem conscious, but they are not. You want me to prove it? Very simple, very elegant proof. Think a thought. Swami, nothing is coming to my mind. <laughs> All right, let me give you a simple thought. Rose is red. Two plus two is four. Think it. And let me ask you a question. Hold on to the thought. Two plus two is four, or a rose is red. Are you aware of 2 plus 2, 4 or is 2 plus 2, 4 aware of you? Very simple. You are aware of 2 plus 2, 4. Who is thinking the thought? You are. The thought is not thinking you. 2 plus 2, 4 is a thought. It is an idea, a piece of knowledge. It is lit up by you. So thoughts are not conscious in themselves. You are conscious. Thoughts come and go in your light. Yeah, I can see some of you beginning to nod. Yes, it's a very simple fact. But we don't pay attention to it. You are consciousness and you are conscious of the mind. Because you are unchanging and the mind is changing, you cannot be the mind. Because you are the experiencer and the mind is experienced, you cannot be the mind. Because you are consciousness and the mind is something that you are conscious of. It is not consciousness, you cannot be the mind. Ashtavakra says, Yadi Deham Prithakritya. Yes, getting goosebumps somewhere. <laughs> yes. At least some are with me. Are you with me? Are you, are you following yes. this? Yes. 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 Always, Vedanta teachers ask three things. Did you hear what I said? Yes. So that you can at least... If not, you know, in the traditional Vedanta schools, you would be made to memorize the verses. Even if you don't memorize, you can at least paraphrase. You say, okay, this is what you said, number one. Number two, did you understand what I said? Understand intellectually. Yes, I am understood. Number three, not only understanding, is it a fact for you now? It should be. It's a fact. I see it. Yeah, it's, it's a fact. Now I'm going to take you into one more thing which can be very unsettling. The I, the ego, that's what we identify ourselves most as. Ego is also a function of the mind. If I'm not the mind, then I'm not the ego either. I will demonstrate to you directly, right now. 
what you call the eye, you are not even that. Not the horizontal eyes, the vertical eye. I am not even the eye. Are you ready? Okay, let's see this. Let's do it. It's again, it's not Ashtavakra, it's Greg Good, the New York psychologist who devised this experiment. It's very interesting. Just sit relaxed, not sleepy, straight but not rigid. Now I'm going to ask you questions and locate it within yourself. You, you just do the experiment for yourself. Mentally say to yourself, I, mentally, I. And there will be a place, keep your eyes open, you have to look at me, the other eyes, keep them open. There will be a place where it feels like, most like I. You know? I will help you to locate it. That's what Greg Good did. So the experiment is like this. I'm going to ask you a question. I, where is this I? Is it draw a line through your waist, horizontal to the ground? Line through your waist mentally. The I that you feel, I, is it above the line or below the line? Uh, above. It would be a very weird person who says, I f my ego is in the knees. <laughs> <laughs> you might say, yeah, if, you might say the knees hurt, but I am not the knees. Above. Just about everybody will say it's above the waist. The I. Okay. Draw one more line parallel to the ground mentally through your chest about this high. And see, I. Is it above this line or below this line? Above. Above, yes. Again, most persons would say above. Then draw one more line like this <laughs> through the neck mentally. I. Is it above the, this line in the neck or below the line in the neck, the eye? Yeah, most people would say that, but at this point, a few might say, few do say, I hear, I, I feel it here more. That's also all right. But let's say most people say, I feel the eye above, mostly in the head. And there are good reasons for that. You know what the reasons are? Because a lot of nerve endings are here, our, most of our sense organs are here. And so we feel a location of awareness here, mostly. That's why. But let's go, with, go on with this. There's a point. You feel the eye somewhere in the head region, most of us. Now draw two parallel lines, vertical lines. One through here, one through here. Where is the eye? On this side of the head, or that side of the head, or here, inside somewhere? Somewhere, right on top, some say right here, some say somewhere behind the eyes, right? Something like that you will feel. Narrow down on it, it's here, somewhere, the eye. You will get a vague location. Some people have an even more sharp perception, like a walnut or something there, in there somewhere. That's where the eye is most evident. It feels it's some, something there. Okay, now the real question. If the I is something there, who is it perceiving that I there? <laughs> I'll repeat the question. I am here. Okay, I'm getting it. What awareness, what is it that says that I am here? To that awareness, even this I is an object. Just as this is an object, the head is an object, the eye is also a feeling, an object, an operation of the mind, being objectified by some awareness behind it. Some of you are getting it. Many are, I can see that, right? Mm -hmm. My point here is, you are not even the eye. You are, you are that which, which sees the eye. Ah. Yadi deham prithakritya. If you can see yourself as not the body. Slowly, little by little. If I am not the body, then what am I? That awareness which cannot be objectified. To which everything else is an object. The world is an object. The body is an object. 
The mind is an object, even the ego is an object to that awareness. You can never objectify it, you can never bring it forward. It's like somebody looking at something through a flashlight and wants to see the source of the flashlight. The more you turn it around, it's behind that. <laughs> In the same way, this consciousness, do not try to objectify it, do not try to catch it. It's the real you. In Sanskrit, there are different names for it. Chit, pure consciousness. Pure not in the sense that it's a good consciousness without impure thoughts. Both pure thoughts and impure thoughts, good thoughts and bad thoughts are illumined. They are objects for this light. It is pure in the sense it is contentless. When, a, when consciousness plus a thought come together, that's an experience. Consciousness by itself is like pure light which reveals. The Upanishad puts it very beautifully. That shining, all else shines. By its light is everything lit up. What lights up this room? You'll say, look at this Swami, the bulb here. The electric light here. Really? Suppose you were not here. Would you still have the experience of a well lit room? No. The bulb lights up the room, but the light of that light is you, the awareness. This is the phrase which is used in Vedanta, light of light. Consciousness is the light, material light. And consciousness is the light of that. Because material light can reveal everything and itself also, only to you the awareness. Right? And could you close that door? It's uh, open, yeah. That light of lights, consciousness. That shining, everything else shines. In sans beautiful Sanskrit, Tameva Bhantam Anubhati Sarvam. By its light, everything is lit up. Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Idam Vibhati. By so the you shining, you the consciousness shining, everything else shines. I'm not being poetic here. Literally, this is a statement of what's happening in your life. You the consciousness shining, your thoughts are revealed. Your thoughts reveal the body and its senses. And the body and the senses reveal the world to you. All through lit up by you, the consciousness. Imagine, the world is there. I can see it. I close my eyes. You close your eyes now. Let me ask you. You can't see the world outside, right? Are you still there? Yeah. yeah. Is it still a kind of an experience? An experience of not seeing? But suppose that consciousness itself were not there, what, what experience would remain? That awareness which sees the world, now does not see the world, sees darkness. Suppose that awareness itself were not there. World is there, body is there, mind is there, everything is there. If that awareness is not there, what would remain? For you, subjectively? Nothing. It would disappear into a void immediately. You shining, everything else shines. By your light is everything lit up. That awareness. If you have followed what I am saying, it's no longer hypothetical. It's no longer philosophy, speculation. I have pointed it out to you. I haven't. Ashtavakra has. Now what remains? Note that every problem is in the body. Every problem is in the mind. That awareness has no problem at all. That consciousness has no problem at all. Never had, never will have. If it, logically, if there is a problem with the consciousness, are you aware of it or not? If you are aware of it, then it's not in consciousness. It's an object of consciousness. A beautiful uh, story in the, how they illustrate it in the Himalayas uh, by the monks. There, there's a story. In the, um, a person goes up to a Swami, a monk in the, in the mountains, and like in Manhattan, they would go to their therapist. <laughs> Swami, I am, in suf I am suffering. Uh, I am in pain. Uh, I am suffering. And the Swami says to him, Are you aware of your suffering? Are you, uh, now you know where the Swami is going. <laughs> are you aware of your suffering? He says, of course I am aware of my suffering. That's why I have come to you. <laughs> I am feeling the pain. That's why I have come to you. If you are feeling the pain, if you are aware of the pain, if you are aware of the suffering, then you are the consciousness which is aware of the suffering. You cannot be suffering. It's an object to your consciousness. Just as this is an object I see, 
I am not the book. Similarly, is an object I see, the shirt, I am not the shirt. This body is an object I see, therefore I am not the body. The pain in the body, if somebody pinches me, the pain there, that's clearly an object which is different from me. So I, the consciousness, am not in pain. And the, the pain is not denied. But the pain, I am that which reveals the pain. This person, but this is not the end of the story. The punchline comes next. This person goes, <laughs> thinks about it. If you do that, you know what happens? A slight space opens up between you and your experience. The object of experience. Between you and your pain. A slight space opens up. It could be physical pain, it could be emotional pain, mental pain, trauma, but a space opens up between you and that. You see, I am not it. It's there, but I am not it. Huh? The moment that opens up, you sense a freedom, a lightness, like a burden of you. Whether it is illness, whether it is emotional suffering, mental suffering, just existential angst, whatever it is, I am not it. It is an experience. I am the experiencer. It is changing. I am the unchanging. It is an object. I am the subject. I am consciousness. It is inert. I cannot be it. You feel a relief. And this man also felt such a relief. He came back to the monk and said, Swami, you are right. I am not suffering. I am so peaceful now. And immediately the Swami scolded him. See, you are not peaceful. You are the witness of the peace in your mind. <laughs> a very great teaching there. Because we, the mind is so subtle, we tend to fall into its trap again and again. Moment the mind becomes calm. Oh, it's an object. I am not the pain. I am not the suffering. As a result, you will see the suffering itself will go away. Most of our suffering is psychological. It will it itself diminish. Even the physical pain will diminish and will become manageable if you do that. But the moment it happens, you fall into the next trap. Ah, oh, the mind is... So it's so peaceful, I am peaceful now. That's also a feeling. That's the mind being peaceful. If that man has thought, oh, I am peaceful, what will happen to him the moment he goes back from uh, the mountains to say Delhi and hits the traffic there? <laughs> People in the United States say that LA has the worst traffic in the country, Manhattan has the worst traffic. Well, they haven't seen Delhi traffic. <laughs> Recently, there was some tension between China and India. And uh, so the, some uh, Chinese news agency, you know, sort of threateningly said, don't you know we are so powerful that the, that the Chinese army can be in New Delhi in, in 24 hours or something like that. And somebody in the news media in India, they quipped back, they said, that's impossible because <laughs> Delhi is heavily defended on all sides by traffic. <laughs> <laughs> if you... And the man when he gets trapped in traffic he would say, Oh, I was so peaceful in the Himalayas and now I'm so miserable here. That's the mind. It's the mind which is peaceful. It's the mind which is disturbed. Ashtavakra says, You are not peaceful or disturbed. You are peace itself. Nothing can touch you. That consciousness you are. And what, he, what does he say? Chiti vishramya tishtasi. St next word is, each word is valuable. Tishtasi in Sanskrit means stay there. Stabilize. Now you know. But still it won't help. It will evaporate like ice if you put it out there in the hot sun. This knowledge. Then you will say, Swami, it, it works sometimes when I listen to the lecture, when I meditate and when I read the book. It works for a while, but then it goes away again. When I'm in, uh, at home or in my job or struggling to make a living, then this knowledge is not giving me peace. Why? Because again, you're, it's there. You are still that consciousness, absolutely at peace. Undisturbed, undisturbable. But what happens is you get caught up with the mind again. So he says, Tishtasi, stay with it, marinate in it, soak it in. More you do it quietly, the more you will be able to do it in active life. Complete serenity within and a life of action outside. It's possible. That's the teaching. You can do it, live your life, be an artist, a corporate executive, a mom, 
a student, whatever. Whatever you do in life. And be completely serene within. You're all right. You are the infinity itself. It, you can neither be increased nor be decreased by anything in life. In fact, there's a... I'll go quickly into um, three other verses which come in sequence much later. We'll do that meditation. I am that consciousness in which all changes come and go. The universe is experienced in me, the awareness. Let me go through the three stages. Each is so profound, you, could, you would think that that's the final truth until he reveals the next level. So three stages, let's see. The first one is Mai Ananta Maham Bodo Vishwapota Itastata Brahmati Swanta Vatena Namamastya Sahishnuta I am an infinite ocean of consciousness. The universe, the entire universe including this body and mind, this person. The whole thing is like a little boat in me, the ocean of consciousness. It moves according to its own laws, the law of causality. What is my attitude? What's the attitude of the ocean towards the little boat? I am not impatient. Na mama asti asahishnuta. I am not impatient. The boat of life rises, sinks, there is birth, there is change, there are good times, there are bad times, finally capped off by the death of this little body. I am the ocean of awareness in, all, in which all this was experienced. I am not impatient. I am eternally calm. And I enjoy the movement of the little boat, whatever it does. First level, we go deeper. Mai Ananta Maham Bodo Vishwa Vichi Swabhavata Ude Tu Vastamayatu Name Vridhi Navakshati Deeper level, I am the infinite ocean of consciousness. The entire universe is like a wave in me. Remember, a boat is different from the ocean, but the wave is the ocean itself. The entire universe is like a wave in me. Udetu vastamayatu. Let the wave arise, let it fade away, let it settle down into the ocean. Name vriddhi navakshati. The ocean neither increases nor is decreased, nor is diminished. Let birth come, I gain nothing by that. Let death come, I lose nothing by that. Success and failure, I enjoy both in serenity. I gain nothing by that, I lose nothing by that. I am not increased by it, by wealth. I am not decreased by poverty. Hmm? Knowledge and ignorance, even worldly happiness and misery, they neither increase me nor diminish me. I am the vast ocean. They are my manifestations. Each wave is a manifestation of the ocean itself, not different from the ocean. Deeper yet. Mai Ananta Maham Bodo Vishwam Nama Vikalpana Ati Shanto Nirakara Eta Deva Hamastita. I the infinite ocean of consciousness and the entire universe is an imagination. Imagine an ocean without waves, vast sheet of water, shining blue, no, not a ripple, not a wave, not a ripple. Without form, deeply peaceful. Thus do I abide from eternity to eternity. Ashtavakra says, abide there. Sukhi Shanta, two words he uses. Sukhi means happy, literally. Here he's talking about the bliss of the Atman, not a burst of pleasure in the mind or the senses. The eternal peace of the self, the self itself. 
That is bliss. That is joy. The word there in Vedanta is Ananda. Bliss. I am that. Shanta. Shanta means peaceful. But it literally means, it actually points to going beyond suffering. Going beyond suffering. Overcoming suffering. That consciousness, that infinite ocean within us, which we are, that is beyond suffering. It can, suffering cannot touch it. I am that. So when do I attain this bliss and going beyond suffering? Adhunaiva, the word means right now, 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 now. This is not separated from you by space. Not a heaven, the Christian heaven or the Hindu heaven or the pure land of the Buddhists. That's a heaven to be attained elsewhere. That's a heaven to be attained else when. Not now. Then. It's not you. It's separate from you. You have to go there. But here what Ashtavakra is speaking about is not separated from you by time. It's now. All the time. It's not separate from you by, by place. There's no place to go to. It's right here. Wherever you are, there it is. You know, one of the most beautiful things I've heard, a gentleman was asked, what's the best time of your life? And he said, right now. <laughs> That's the most mature answer. Ask a kid, the best time is when I grow up, be like my big, big brother or big sister and go to college. That's the best time of my life. Ask a college kid, when I graduate and get this great job and I get to do what I want to do, that's the best time of my life. Ask an old person, when I was a kid, that was the best time of my life. <laughs> Ashtavakra would say, wherever you are, whatever you are, that is the best time of your life. Because the externals do not matter. You are there, God is there. We think we exist in a real world. Ashtavakra says, the world seems real because you are here. Notice one thing. Dreams. We say they are just a dream. When do we say that? When we wake up. But when you were in the dream, actually dreaming that dream, it actually felt very real, like waking life. Do you know why? Because you were there. Vivekananda said, things are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them. Then we run after them or we run away from them. <laughs> This world, this universe is like pictures, pictures in, on, the, on, on your consciousness, on you the consciousness. There are pictures emerging, shining, disappearing. It de dep depends entirely on you. It borrows life from you. It borrows existence from you. It borrows value from you. And then the veil descends and we think, that's real, that's valuable, I must have it or I'm miserable. <laughs> That's the game. Adunaiva, right now, right here, and it's you. Not rhetoric, not a claim. It's pointed out, it's, it's being pointed out directly. That ocean of peace and joy is within us right now. We just pointed it out. Wherever you want, whenever you want, it's available to you. Push it out to a distance, call it a name, God, Father in Heaven, Vishnu, Shiva, Durga, Allah, you have a religion. Ashtavakra says, it's you. I could go on, but I won't. Yeah. The whole uh, book is like that. It goes on and on and on. But you, we still have a little bit of time for Q&A, right? All right, yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, Ramakrishna and Vivekananda's? We asked Vivekananda once why we had never heard of non-dualism prior to Ramakrishna. And Vivekananda said that it was because it was a pen of Ramakrishna to bring that to the world. <clears throat> and that 
<coughs> that what inspired Swamiji was to hear Ramakrishna say it's not compassion to Jiva, but worship of Shiva. Yes. And that's, that's the non dualism Yes. Could you talk a little bit also with that about the renunciation for householder, the path of the hot people? All right. Very good. Very good. Often, Ashtavakra is taken as rejecting and cutting down religion. That's not true. The mature way to handle this book is it provides a foundation for religion. That's what he's talking about. Whether it's the path of, path of service, the path of devotion, path of meditation. Because Ashtavakra says shocking things. You know what traps you in this world? The only thing that traps you in this world is because you're, you're trying to meditate. Why are you trying to meditate? You are the absolute. Now that can be very dangerous if you don't handle it properly. <laughs> He's not telling you not to meditate. You can meditate, you, you may not meditate. Whatever you do, you are the absolute. There's no doubt about it. But um, he puts it in a very radical way. Before I forget, I'll answer your questions. I remember the two things. Uh, the renunciation for the householder, path of bhakti, that's one. The second one, the first one was Shiva Jnani Jiva Seva, worship of um, all living beings by seeing the divine in them. Mm. Jiva means sentient being, us, we are jivas. Shiva is, the, is God. So knowing all sentient beings to be God, worship them. Mm. That was Sri Ramakrishna's teaching. And that is real non-dualism, non-dualism in action. When you open your eyes, one of uh, uh, my sannyasa guru, uh, Ranganathanandiji, he said, what is spirituality? When I close my eyes, I find peace within. When I open my eyes, my attitude is, what can I do for you? That is spirituality. That's very beautiful. But it's not just shallow rhetoric. It's based on deep non-dual non -dual thinking, non-dual philosophy. But before I go into that, I, I told you so much about the poetic quality of the translation here. Let me read the verses which I mentioned just now. Let me read the way he has translated it. From the very first chapter. Set your body aside. Sit in your own awareness. You will at once be happy, forever still, forever free. Forever and truly free. The single witness of all things. Each of these phrases is enough to point out to the reality within us. The single witness of all things. But if you see yourself as separate, then you are bound. Then you are bound. Know you are one pure awareness. With the fire of this conviction, Burn down the forest of ignorance. Free yourself from sorrow and be happy. Very beautiful verse. The self, that means you. The self looks like the world. You know what the world is? It's you. You look like that. But this is just an illusion. The self is everywhere. That means you are everywhere. One, still, free, perfect. For you are already free, without action or flaw, luminous and bright. Here's the dangerous part. Your only bondage is your habit of meditation. <laughs> 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 
Here is a beautiful one. For God is infinite within the body and without, like a mirror, like a mirror, and the image in a mirror. Imagine a mirror. This is particularly uh, dear to my heart because many, many years ago when I was a kid and my, we were driving in the family, in the car, my dad was driving and we were going through a, uh, towards our hometown. As we were approaching the hometown, there were no street lights there. It was very dark, a bit like Sedona. I mean, very dark at night, you know, dark sky. And in the distance, the hometown, the sit lights of the city you could see shining. And you could see the whole city in the driving mirror of my dad's car. Uh -huh. Somehow that really struck me, you know. I don't know why. Imagine how thrilled I felt a decade later when I became a monk and I was beginning to read some of the texts, non-dual texts. There is one text called Dakshinamurti Stotram, written by Shankaracharya. And it starts like this. Vishwam darpana drishyamana nagari tulyam nijantargatam. This universe is like a city seen in a mirror. <laughs> what is the mirror? It is you. You are the consciousness. Remember, nijantargatam means in yourself. In a city seen in a mirror, immediate doubt is, okay, there is a city outside and it is reflected in the mirror. Here it says, there is no universe outside. The only thing that is, is the mirror is you. And in you shines this universe. Now, in the city, there are buildings and there are, there are birds and people walking and chariots in those days. It is, the description is that are chariots and lakes. And yet all of that is what? The glass, it's the mirror. In the mirror, there are no buildings, birds, people or lakes. It's just the glass throughout. Similarly, right now what we are experiencing as my body, as people, as chairs, as building trees and the sky and the earth and the mountains, all of it is in consciousness which I am and is nothing other than consciousness. And so on it goes. Now to your question, I'll answer the second one first. Renunciation for the householder. Ashtavakra is big on renunciation. Let go. And that's many people find that difficult. But remember, he's talking to whom? He's talking to an emperor. He's not telling the emperor to let go of the empire. Everything goes on as it is. You let go inside. If I hold on to one thing, one reflection in the mirror, if I hold on to as real, the whole thing becomes real to me. <coughs> Step back from the reflection and be the mirror. You are the mirror. You are. When you be the mirror, it's not some kind of imagination you're practicing. It's the truth. You're staying with the truth. Right now we are living in a world of delusion and imagination. That's why we tend to get hurt so much. Okay. What is the renunciation for the householder? I'll explain it in a very simple way. If you, if you are not being told to get rid of, you know, husband, wife, children, house. No. But then what are we being, being told to get rid of? What are, we, what are we to give up? How do you renounce? Like this. There's a story of a, um, of a farmer who would lay out the fruits and vegetables to, you know, on the sun. And uh, a monkey would see that and he would carefully creep down the tree and come and grab the fruits and run away with them before the farmer could come out and catch him. And the farmer thought, I'm going to treat, teach this monkey a lesson. So he got a big jar, a narrow neck jar, and he put the bananas in there. <laughs> and so the monkey comes down, monkey watches him carefully. Monkeys are very clever. Okay, there's a monkey story I must tell you, but before that, let me complete this story. <laughs> so monkey comes down the tree and creeps up, and puts its hand inside the uh, jar, grabs the banana, but of course it can't take it out because the banana gets stuck there. And the farmer was waiting for this. He rushes at him with a stick, a cane, to thrash the poor monkey. Now the monkey can escape. It just has to let go of the banana and run away. But it's a monkey and it can't let go of the banana. And so poor thing gets a beating from the farmer. Now how can the poor monkey escape the beating? The monkey mind must become the monk mind. <laughs> So, 
internally do not grasp. If you must grasp, grasp this pure awareness which you are. Stay there. Rashtabhakra says, Tishtasi, stay, stay. Don't catch hold of things in the world. What about things in the world? They are coming. As I said, welcome them. Give them a cup of tea. <laughs> they will go away. Everything goes away. You say namaste, thank you. Whether it is health or disease, youth, old age, body, anything. People in your life, money, success, fame, everything goes away. And they come also. Don't get stuck on it. You don't depend on it. You never did. They depend on you. You are not attached to anything. That's the monkey mind becoming the monk mind. That's the renunciation for the householder. The positive way of looking at this is, what Sri Ramakrishna says, that you see God in everything. The same divinity within me is there everywhere. Once Sri Ramakrishna went to a gathering, there were devotees, Vaishnavas, and one of the sayings is, have compassion for the suffering. And Sri Ramakrishna went into an ecstasy and said, compassion, compassion, who are you to show compassion? It is veritably God himself. Not compassion, but worship. See God in the human, in the living being. He didn't even say human. Jiva means sentient being, even in animals and other sentient beings. See God in them and worship God in them. In, in uh, Bengali, he said, Shiva Jnane Jiva Seva. Jiva means sentient being, us, and also all other animals. And know them. Shiva Jnane, Shiva means God. One of the names of God. Jnana means knowledge. So Shiva, Jnana, Jiva, Seva. Seva means service. Serve all sentient beings knowing them to be God. I love the card that Swami Shankaranamji, he gave me yesterday. Serving the divine in all. The card says in your card. <laughs> so Shiva, Jnana, Jiva, Seva. That's the thing. Vivekananda, he went away, he used to meditate in the Himalayas and he said later on, um, he who runs away to meditate and die, and die in a cave has missed the way. And I read this when I was sitting and meditating, not literally in a cave, but in, 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 a, in a hut in the Himalayas. I'd gone through a lot of trouble to run away, I literally almost. I, 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 was, I was a monk in a beautiful monastery. And I said, I want to stay by myself in a cave in, in the Himalayas, forgotten. I, I loved that line from Vivekananda. By the world forgotten and the world forgetting. The world has forgotten you and you are also forgetting the world. Remember, the world forgets much faster than you forget. <laughs> I would like to be like that. And some of the monks tried to stop me and where will you go and who will feed you and things like that. And the more senior monk said, let him go. <laughs> let him learn. So it's not, no, spirituality is not on mountaintop or in the forest. It's everywhere. So I went and sat there and I saw Vivekananda saying, he who runs away to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave has missed the way. One. Second, he who plunges into the foolishness and the vanities of life has missed the way. Now that's strange. If you run away from life, you've missed the way. If you plunge into the vanities of life, you've missed the way. Then what is the way? Then third, Vivekananda says, the way is to divinize life is to see God wherever you are and with whomever you are in. If you find God here, you've got God everywhere. If you don't find God here, you won't find Him anywhere. Vivekananda said, non-dualism, I will bring the non-dualism which was the possession of a few monks and pundits, Sanskrit scholars. I will bring the Advaita philosophy from the forests and the caves and broadcast it to the cities. That's what he did. Yeah. This is the age of democratization. All knowledge, wealth, power being scattered. You know what is the internet doing? So all of this, the knowledge should be scattered to everybody. Everybody should possess it. Yes, if you are an extremely austere, I've seen such people, austere monk living and meditating hours and hours in the fastness of the Himalayan mountains, you will translate this into reality much faster. But here in this world, it may be a little more difficult. But to the extent that we try, to that extent it will immediately give results. That's the great thing about this. To 
to the extent you try. Try for five minutes, you will get that result. Some amount of peace will descend upon you. Yeah. I think one more question. Yes. Okay. Um, if everything is Rama, yes. Isn't the body also Rama? And what would be the helpfulness of making this distinction that the body is not? Right. Very good question. Have you noticed one thing? I seem to have said, or Ashtavakra seems to have said, two distinct things. One is, I am not the body, not the mind. Huh? Before that, you see yourself as apart from the body and rest in pure consciousness. So I am pure consciousness, not the mind, not the body. And next he says, everything in the universe, which means body also, mind also, everything is Brahman. Aren't they contradictory? They are not. It's like this. You, Advaita proceeds in two steps. In fact, I gave a talk in Santa Barbara. The title of the talk was the answer to your question. Two steps to the not two. <laughs> what are the two steps? First, we must get rid of, you know, the, what Mark Twain said, I know just it, it just ain't so. I think I am the body. First, I must see that I am the witness consciousness. Step back from the body, step back from the mind, metaphorically speaking, and realize I'm the witness consciousness. Then I see all bodies and minds, including this one, they are nothing other than the witness consciousness. It's that, that consciousness alone which appears as all the objects of consciousness. Then only non-duality is established. See that one consciousness appears as everything, then there is not two. Non-duality means what? Not two. Non-dual. Not two. If you stop at the first step, you definitely have two. I am pure consciousness and here is a mind and a body and a world and so many millions and billions of entities. So what was the point of that exercise? It's this. First of all, to get rid of the identification with body-mind. Step back into our real nature as pure consciousness. Then see everything, including body and mind. Everything is a manifestation of that pure consciousness. But this is not pantheism. Pantheism means God has become everything. Spinoza, for example. But Spinoza, it's unfairly accused of being pantheist. If you, it's actually very Vedantic. If you go deeper into Spinoza, you find this. What's the problem with that thing? If uh, the ultimate reality has become a desk, really, really become a desk, and has scratched the desk, then Brahman is also scratched. If I suffer, then Brahman has really suffered. So suffering is real and uh, death is real, then what's the point of saying um, that I am Brahman? I have got real suffering and real death. No. The pure consciousness, the absolute, only appears as this world. Retaining its perfection as the absolute all the time. Vivekananda put it this way. One of his disciples, a young, young American lady, and Mary Hale, she wrote in a poem, in verse to Vivekananda, I have understood what you have taught, that all is God. And he wrote back in verse, this is published, he wrote back in verse, I have never given such strange doctrine, never taught such strange doctrine that all is God. She was outraged. I am quoting you, you said it. <laughs> Vivekananda said, no, I didn't say that. I did not say that all is God. I said God only is, all is not. It is Brahman alone. Would you say all waves are water? Or would you say water only is? Compared to water, there is no such separate thing called a wave. It is water alone that appears as waves. It's not that there are many things. It's only one thing and that one thing is water. There is only one thing that is the absolute pure consciousness which you are. You appear as the universe. If you actually became the universe, then this would be re the reality that is and then all suffering and everything becomes as you see it. No. There is a subtle distinction. In Vedanta it is put in this way. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance and you are none other than Brahman. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jiva, Brahmaivanapara. Brahman alone is real. The Absolute alone is real. The universe is an appearance and you, the sentient being, are none other than that Absolute. This is the way it is put. 
So to answer to your question, it's a really good question. I'm good, good, glad you caught it. Many people don't catch it. Then they become confused afterwards. Am I everything or not? Remember, everything is your appearance. There is no everything apart from the real you. Then it is non-duality. Yes. <coughs> you are the universe means you appear as the universe. You are real. The universe is not real apart from you. When I say there are, there is gold and a golden ornaments, a bracelet, necklace, ring, whatever. If somebody does not understand what gold is, first of all, what do you have to do? You have to say the, the, there is something called gold apart from the bracelet. The reality of the bracelet is gold. Once you have understood what gold is, then you realize bracelet, ring, necklace, they are all nothing but gold. This is the answer to your question. Yeah. They are not two different things. But first you must treat them as if they are different in order to understand gold. Do we have any more questions? We have run out of time. Very good. So yes. I yes. Have, uh, up to 12, oh, the two, you can have too much of a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember we had courses in communication when we were kids, college kids. And I don't remember much of it, but I remember this much. That one of the rules was, they had very nice rules about speaking. You finish before your uh, audience is, uh, audience is patient, patience is finished. <laughs> oh, the monkey story. The monkey story. What was the monkey? Oh, the monkey story. It's not at all, at all relevant, just, but just it's very cute. So I'll end with a funny story. <laughs> To lighten the mood, Ashtavakra can be heavy. <laughs> Though Ashtavakra is the lightest of them all, yeah. Yeah. we are heavy. I remember there was a Kabir singer. Sing you know, have heard of the mystic called Kabir? Yeah. Uh, it was in India. Was a great mystic, devotion, meditation, knowledge, all of that fused into extraordinary music. He used to say such things. Even if you translate into English, it still retains the power. With open eyes do I see my beloved. Mm -hmm. Not just in meditation, not just in the temple. Mm -hmm. With open eyes I do I see my beloved. Beloved means here the, the Lord, God. And many such things. Anyway, <laughs> funny story. One of the Kabir singers, he said this. He said, be light. What happens to heavy things? They sink. Is the Indian idea of samsara is like an ocean. You sink in the ocean if you are heavy. If you are light, you float. Be light. So we'll end with some light story. The monkey story goes like this. Um, there was this vegetable seller, just like this farmer we mentioned. He used to go um, to the city to sell the vegetables. And he would pass through a little forest. And the, he would have a basket full of vegetables. And there would be monkeys living on the tree. And they would scamper down the tree and snatch away the vegetables from the branches and before he could catch them they would go up there and eat the vegetables. So he thought what could he do? And then he hit upon a plan. He knew that monkeys mimic, you know. And they actually do that. You throw something at them, they might throw something back at you. Um, so he threw a stone at the monkeys and the monkeys threw the vegetables back at him and he recovered the vegetables. <laughs> And he went back and so on. Many years later, his son had grown up and he was looking after the farm and his father gave him this advice. My son, when you go to the city, um, you will pass through this little forest and there are these mischievous monkeys and they will snatch your vegetables. If they do, don't worry, just throw a stone at them, they'll throw the vegetables down at you and you'll be fine. Okay. And so that son goes through and, and lo and behold, the monkeys scamper down there and they snatch the vegetables and run up the tree and he says, okay, I've got this. He puts the basket down and takes up a throne, uh, stone and throws it at them. And the monkeys who are sitting there, they look down at him and of course they can speak. So the monkey says, do you think only you have a father? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let me end with a peace chat. Om. Oh.
शांति 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 हरि ओ तत्सत श्री राम कृष्णार्पण मस्तु